Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in. We're excited to be taking a deep dive with you into some of the amazing work our customers are doing with Bill. Over the span of the next few months, we're gonna be highlighting customers from different industries and different verticals, taking you on a journey through the cutting edge products they're designing. For the first part of this customer series, we're chatting with the team over at Motivo Engineering. Motivo is an innovative product development firm based out of Southern California. And while their roots are based in vehicle motion, they've expanded the scope of their expertise and services to encompass a broad variety of different clients, ranging from small startups all the way to industry leaders. We're super excited to get into this. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julius Swain. I'm the manager of the mechanical engineering department here at Motivo. I've been at the company for six years. And uh, sadly, I have to admit that I've been an engineer for 20 years already. So I've seen the evolution of CAD and CAD management uh, solutions for quite a while, almost since the beginning. And then my name is Kevin. Uh, I'm a mechanical engineer at Motivo. I've been here for about a year and a half, uh, but I have about uh, eight years of engineering experience. Um, came from working in kind of uh, ag tech area and uh, now working at Motivo. Great, cool. And, and so uh, let's dive right in here. And so because Build worked directly with you guys, we've heard a lot about some of the cutting edge projects that you've been working on, but. For some of the viewers out there who might not be as familiar, could you just go into some of the projects that Motif has been working on recently? Uh, yeah, let me let me start with what Motivo does, and then I'll go a little bit into who we do it for. Uh, we provide solutions to our clients, and our clients could range from a single visionary person that has an idea but doesn't have the expertise on how to turn that idea into a product. Uh, all the way to a big corporation that maybe manufactures airplanes and they have a side project that they need an accelerated development team, um, they come to us. And then to answer the real question you asked, um, exciting projects we have right now, uh, we have pretty strict NDAs, so I'm going to skip revealing the true identity of our visionary clients. Uh, however, I can tell you a little bit about the markets we touch. Uh, I'm going to say that in the next three to four years, if you see electric vehicles that take off vertically and that are flying people from an airport to a stadium or to a downtown area, Anywhere in the world, there's a good chance we've done something with them. In addition to that, um, without revealing too much, there's a good chance that if you ordered something online uh, at the warehouse where that item was placed in a package, our system helped uh, accelerate that process. Any any more exciting projects without revealing too much? Um, no, I mean, you know, we, we do work with a lot of different industries. That's one of the things I love about this is that we, you know, can go from one day working in ag tech to one day working in, you know, with, with uh, aerospace and then back to, you know, automotive and you know, all sorts of different types of projects and clients. And it's one of the, one of the great things about working at Motivo. Yeah. And, and, and that's something that we've also noticed talking to just several different PD firms is, I mean, you're straddling a, a variety of different industries. And so it seems like there isn't really a, a sort of one size fits all approach to design across the board. And I'm curious, like, how exactly would you say your design process shifts when working with like, say a smaller startup versus like your major enterprise customers or in a similar vein, like how much of the different industries that you're working in impact the design process? Uh, I think we've distilled our craft to, and the essence is exactly one size fits all. It's all about asking uh, 
what is the biggest unknown we need to solve first? Uh, in other words, uh, we strive to fail fast. Whether it's a small project that might apparently be simple or a large build of a ground up build of a novel electric vehicle that has to be autonomous and has to be certified and it has to be done in six months. It's all about managing risk and, and getting the answers that are blocking the next step. And that's the beauty of, of what we do at Motivo and how we do it. We, we approach head on the hardest questions and, and we were able to discard, oh, this we can figure out later, but right now we need to figure out this immediately uh, before we can move on to the next step. And we take the client along with us uh, for the ride. Got it. Striving to fail fast. I, I really like that. And so how, how would you say that you get to that point, though, is how you approach, like, say, communication and collaboration within, like, specific teams, like, just in terms of how you talk with, like, your clients? Does it change between, like, the smaller staff projects versus larger projects? I, I have to imagine that, of course, like, with bigger companies, there's just more different, like, parties and moving pieces to kind of get through versus a smaller startup? Can you just blast through things and go very quickly? I think um, it doesn't really change that much. I mean, sometimes we'll have uh, larger teams take on some of these uh, projects and sometimes we'll have smaller teams. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it doesn't really change a whole lot about how you know we communicate, how we work together. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, you know, we, we, we are flexible enough to be able to kind of adapt to whatever that project needs, uh, whether that's a, a larger team that we just throw as many people at it as, po as fast as possible and, as, and try to, you know, figure out these, these challenges, these unknowns as fast as possible, or whether it's a, you know, one person team where it's just, you know, this is a, uh, this is going to be a pretty quick burn project. We just need one person working on it full time and, you know, that's it. <laughs> Do you see challenges in <clears throat> like the different stages of hardware development when working with, let's say, like the Kickstarter campaigns of the world as opposed to enterprise accounts? Or would you say it's fairly the same across the board for both types of your customers? Uh, I'd say that the larger the company, the slower the back end will be because more people need to buy in or sign off on <clears throat> direction A or direction B. On the other hand, smaller companies might, especially smaller companies that are that are very, very young, you know, startups at the very, very beginning of their of their life, they might not fully understand the product development cycle, the product development tempos, the surprises, the changes in, oops, now this component is not available. Oh, but it's not an important component. Well, yeah, but it's blocking this, 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 and that. And it's gonna delay by four months unless you are ready to pivot and go this other direction. Whereas larger companies, most likely they've seen it all, but they are also harder negotiators. <laughs> On that note though, I mean, I think that's one of the, one of the um, huge values that we provide to some of these bigger clients is that they have all this bureaucracy and they, ha they have to move a little slower. And sometimes that's why they reach out to us because we can move quickly. We can make decisions quickly and pivot. And that's what they need us for so that we can, you know, be that resource for them. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, I'd like to add too that multiple of our clients uh, ongoing and also in the past have been surprised about something positive we brought uh, that they didn't anticipate, which is because we are pretty good at figuring out what is the hardest question we need to answer uh, the 
quickest. We force questions onto the client that forces them to get internal alignment because maybe they have a structures team, uh, an engine team, an electrical team, uh, 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 supply chain manager, and a CTO. And maybe they weren't talking to each other as much as they should have. And by us forcing those questions and, and requesting that, hey, we need to solve this like immediately, or these are the consequences if we don't solve it, it forces them to, to actually communicate. And they thanked us for bringing alignment within the, the client structure. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. On the prototyping side of things, um, so one of the things you guys do, you'd mention is helping your customers also in their transition from prototype to production. Uh, when it comes to prototyping, how do you guys handle it? Are there differences with how you handle it with different processes with your customer, like from the scale of small to large customers? Yeah, uh, the, the key to answering that is time. What is the biggest question we need to answer? What, what do we need to build first to make sure that the next step is the right one? Make, to, to make sure we didn't forget something basic, to make sure that uh, this doesn't interfere with something that wasn't in the CAD that the client provided. So um, 3D printing for relatively small-ish volume components is a quick way to get something in your hands and fit it to its final destination to see if cable management um, is going to be compatible with that space plane. But here at Motivo, we have an incredi incredible on-site fabrication team with a very advanced laser cutter that can chew one inch steel like, like butter with a very clean cut. Uh, we have a CNC bench press. We have very talented welders, uh, aluminum, steel, you name it. So anything that is metal is probably going to be faster than 3D printing. Now, if we have the CNC complex parts with very tight tolerances, we have a network of local vendors that will be much more suitable and much quicker than, than us in delivering these, these high precision parts. So we do whatever we are best at and we recognize where it doesn't make sense for us to do it. And we have a huge uh, network that we rely on. Yeah, I think to, to Julius's point, I think the, you know, our goal is to usually work as quickly as possible. And, you know, sometimes that is a, a printed design. Sometimes that's us going out to the, you know, back shop, finding some cardboard, building something out of cardboard and hot glue. Um, or maybe just running down to Home Depot and grabbing some plywood and, you know, two by fours and screws and putting it together that way. You know, it, on the other side of things, because of the technology that we have, the, the laser, the press break, and the talented team of fabricators we have, sometimes that can actually be a lot faster. Uh, you know, I've many times have just sent out a, a you know sheet metal part, and within about thirty minutes, it's in my hand, and it's just really cool to be able to just quickly iterate on prototyping that way. That's awesome. So it sounds like a lot of just, let's say, like vertical integration in the process with being able to do things yourselves yeah. and in-house more quickly. That's awesome. And and CAD is not necessarily always the first step to get something built. Because, uh, I mean, we joke here, but sometimes CAD stands for Cardboard Assisted Design. Definitely. And so one, one thing that we also wanted to focus in on is that we've heard that Motivo operates with some sort of more unconventional processes um, in place. And for example, we've heard about like your build-a-thons, um, 
we're curious is there like anything else that feels maybe out of the norm for like a typical design process and also like how exactly did those end up getting implemented into Motivo's workflows? Did you just one day come up with the idea for a build-a-thon? Did somebody bring that in from a previous workspace? Uh, curious to see who's driving that. I mean, I think the the whole build-a-thon, it, you know, it's a it's a way for us to you know kind of install a little bit of competition within the team, but like it, it's it's a fun way to you know uncover those unknowns as quickly as possible. Remember we, we had, a, had one recently on a project where, you know, Julius came in and said, okay, well, we've got you, you, you three engineers have these three, you know, unique ideas and approaches and they are completely different, you know, uh, and tackling different problems from different perspectives. Uh, by the end of the day, I want to see a, a little, you know, a prototype built and, you know, try not to use 3d printing, just try to go, go out, find some materials in the shop and put it together as quickly as easily to, to, to prove that point. Um, those kind of things I think are really valuable. Um, and, uh, it's, it's, I think it's not always, uh, you know, necessary for some of our projects, but oftentimes for these projects that have a lot of unknowns and you can approach them from various ways. Uh, and you know, these are problems that have never been solved before. So they, they can be solved in, in so many different in different ways. Those kind of things can be very helpful. And and all all those things are are born in house. So the the ideas for the for the team building events, for the workshops, the uh, the friendly competitions, we have voluntary committees. If you're interested in in providing ideas, then join this or organize a meeting. Hey, I, I have this idea. Uh, what if we prepare? I'll give you an example, a very recent one. Yesterday, we had a forklift rodeo. Uh, so, of course, ev all, everyone in the, in the shop is forklift certified. But the person who had the idea to do the forklift rodeo said, well, what if we open up a certification process for people outside the shop? And we had five or six people that wouldn't traditionally be forklift certified. And we brought a, a, a trainer, uh, a person that, that can actually certify you. And we had it certified uh, earlier this week and last week. And yesterday we had a friendly competition on, you know, skills with, uh, with the forklift. And today we have an internal Jeopardy competition and the questions are going to be about, you know, things at Motivo, past clients, past projects, and stuff like that. And all those are ideas that were born uh, in-house. By the way, the recently certified forklift uh, people were not in the top three. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they need more practice. Yes. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> seems like, seems though, like there's you two. Did you two get certified? Me personally, no. No, I wish. I, I had been certified at a previous job, but uh, was too busy handling client stuff <laughs> right during our, during our uh, certification process. Next year. Next year. Got to pick your priorities. Um, and cool. So, so one thing that I want to revisit here is um, you two have both talked a bit about how kind of iterative this process is because it really is like in your case like a one size fits all approach here and so with all the different customers that you have on board over at Motivo how do you find yourselves applying different learnings and tactics acquired from say one project to another project and how does that exactly work is it that one like a, an engineer on one project um, just takes what they've learned and then brings it to the next project that they're on do you have breakout sessions to discuss um, things that are working in one group um, to apply them in other areas. Ah, you're revealing the secret of Motivo. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, that's that's the beauty of, of working on so many different projects. I'll, I'll give you an example. This week alone, we have about 20 ongoing projects, which means that on average, uh, any engineer or, or technician or fabricator will be touching two to four projects on the same week, 
which forces you to constantly be switching your mindset, which inevitably benefits everyone because you can connect dots between between projects. Uh, repeating, I don't know, uh, I need a bracket to mount a sensor for this project that is a uh, uh, vehicle retrofit. And turns out I'm using a very similar sensor in this ag tech, you know, robot actually connecting dots. You know what? We can use the exact same sensor, which means that the technician can make two harnesses at once and we can use the same fasteners and we can develop it quicker. And very often you find yourself connecting dots between projects that have absolutely nothing to do uh, with with each other. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, you know, uh, each person is going to have their own experiences with each project, but one of the things we also try to do is capture lessons learned at the end of each project because, you know, we have so many projects to come through. Not everybody is able to actually work on every single project because there's just too many. Um, and so at the end of every project, what we do is we, you know, we make sure to capture all of the lessons learned from that project, whether those are, you know, key, you know, specific mechanical details, or if those are, uh, uh, you know, programmatic, like, you know, how we track the project or something like that. We, we document all of those and we save them internally so they can be referenced later by anybody. But then we also present those to the team, the larger team, so that everybody has access to kind of that knowledge. Um, and that's something that, uh, you know, I've really, in my previous experience, never seen. And that that's a huge, huge help uh, to kind of, you know, approach projects from different, different perspectives. Yeah, also, in, in addition to that, uh, we are great at connecting dots, but we're also good at separating dots that should not be connected. So imagine you have, uh, which we have had, uh, two competing uh, clients that have a very similar product, but they come to us with their own intellectual property, their own patents, their own um, market strategy, and we need to fully understand uh, their ask and make sure that we are separating the, the knowledge and the technical approach we do for one to make sure that there is no spillage from one to the other. So dot connecting is great, but you also have to protect dots uh, from um, accidentally getting too close. Yeah, and that's the, the flexibility of having this large team is what allows us to do that. I mean, you know, we have we can we can have uh, you know different teams led by different senior engineers. You know, uh, I can have them be completely separate or. If we, if we need them to be, you know, communicating, we can do that too. Yeah, and, and at the root of all this is something we <clears throat> we focus on very heavily on on your first week at Motivo, which is whatever you learned in your past experience, forget it because here at Motivo, the fail fast is very important, and you can only fail fast if you ask questions and you're not embarrassed to admit you don't know something or that you might not be the most uh, skilled person for that particular area of expertise. So raise your hand. Hey, I need help solving this. What can I do? Because there is a very high probability that someone else has done it. And if not, we will rally together and find a, an external um, worldwide specialist that can help us. So ask questions and fail fast. Yeah, it's one of the nice things about having people like Julius, like, you know, who have been here for so long, is that, you know, he's seen everybody that has worked on every project. And so when I have a question about, you know, Project X, I can ask him and he'll go, oh, you know, I know that, you know, this engineer over here worked on something very similar. Go talk to him. And usually that's a really nice uh, workflow. Definitely. And, and Julius, I mean, you've been at Motivo for a while now. And so I'm also curious to to know how exactly have customer needs shifted over 
the last decade or so, um, both in respect to like the technical class, but also just general integration with your customers. So um, I know some some teams might want you to have a more integrated process where it feels like the Motivo engineers are part of their in-house team. Some might want it to just be more removed, give us a finished product. Um, how have you seen things shift? Um, we've seen market shifts. Uh, I'll give you an example. 10 years ago, we were already working on autonomous vehicles, road vehicles, like, let's call it cars. Uh, we've had about 10 autonomous vehicle startups, half of which you will definitely have seen uh, being tested out in the Bay Area. Uh, some transport people, some transport goods. And recently we've seen a shift where it seems like the autonomous vehicle market is hitting some roadblocks, mostly related to insurance and, and regulation issues. And right now we're seeing an, uh, a trend where the autonomous vehicles are now flying. So already five years ago, we, all, we were already working on uh, electric uh, EV tolls, electric vertical takeoff uh, vehicles. So we are at the forefront of technology and the things we're working on right now, you won't see until you know five to 10 years from now. So that's th those are the, the shifts we've seen in the market. Shifts on the client side, I think that there's something that is always a constant, which is all our clients want their product as quickly as possible. So one thing we've adapted to is we've learned, like Kevin mentioned, you know, in, in all our lessons learned, uh, lessons learned, uh, when we close out a project, what worked, what didn't, what is something we definitely need to remind ourselves when the next project starts is uh, client management and expectations management and sharing information and educating clients that maybe don't fully understand that things almost never go according to plan, but that planning is critical. You need to plan, but the moment you have a plan, you know something's gonna happen that you're gonna have to pivot. And bringing the client along for the ride and, and providing them with the information they need to understand the situation is something that we've adapted uh, over the years to make sure that our clients have a positive experience when they're working uh, with us. Yeah, and sometimes that means inviting them here and working with them here. Uh, sometimes that just means, uh, you know, a one point of contact once a week and just giving them updates. But obviously, yeah, we're flexible to that. Yeah. Uh, so and you guys are good. Oh. A lot of just like, let's say, pressure on timelines for everything from your customers. But at the same time, you know, one, you're able to do a lot of things in-house yourself to keep things moving more quickly. But then two, at the same time, keeping your customers involved in your process also gives them that invisibility so that when they get to Gen 2 or, you know, whatever for their products, they've gone through it with you guys already. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly it. And something we've we've improved over the years is being very, very factual and presenting the client with the, it's almost like the choose your own adventure. We, we have this roadblock and you have two options. We can, we can go down the original path, but uh, this component is going to delay your initial release by three months, or we can find this um, novel solution that requires, uh, I don't know, changing the controls strategy and changing the sensors and 
it accelerates the timeline by X months, but the downside is that it's going to cost you this much more and we're going to have to take 10 steps back so we can move forward, explaining very, very clearly the possibilities, pros and cons for each thing. We always have our preferred path, but we let the client go first. I remember from the manufacturing days, there are three trade-offs are speed, quality, and cost. So pick or poison. Yeah, pick two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if, right. if you add it to, to the three you had, if you add, uh, and I wanted uh, ISO certified or AS9100 certified, <laughs> uh, then the challenges are pretty, pretty uh, intense really does sound like a choose your own adventure here. Um, and so Julius, one thing that you mentioned was, I mean, you talked a bit about EV tools. Um, there's a lot of cutting edge innovation going on right now in the world and our future state is gonna look a lot different from what our current is right now. And so say like 10 years down the line, I mean, how exactly do you see the world changing? Of course, with like all the hype around AI these days, let's say you have like a magic eight ball and you can shake it and get any sort of like AI tool you want, what do you want your AI tool to do? I would like my AI tool to make itself disappear. I'm, I'm old school. I like, I like drawing things on paper. I like the, the old school thought process. AI can help you automate things that nobody likes, like filling out your timesheet, you know, every week, just, grab information from here and just put it over there and, and, you know, that's great, but the edge cases in AI are, are the hard ones for me to, to same thing with autonomous vehicles. You can have an autonomous vehicle drive very safely on a road that is nicely paved with nice lighting conditions with let's say nominal uh, traffic situations, but the edge cases are the ones that are very, very difficult to train, very, very difficult to program. And it's something that humans, whether you like it or not, uh, we have something that, and this is the old me, you know, <laughs> saying that I don't think an AI system can have as many edge cases covered as as a human brain. Now, in addition to the to the AI question, if you um, you you were asking about ten years from now, I think the most exciting thing that I'm looking forward to seeing is the evolution of uh, batteries, power storage. With batteries getting smaller and more compact, it's going to be very, very similar to um, computing power uh, chips, you know, or packaging more and more and more transistors in them. Uh, a, a two terabyte hard drive now is the size of, you know, a fingernail. Two terabytes in the 90s were the size of a room. So... I think that batteries will will probably be as revolutionary as computing power. And it will open up doors to uh, autonomous flying vehicles, uh, uh, houses that can be powered unlimited, you know, amounts of time for very, very little input, you know, solar power. Uh, wind might be able to generate much more than now. So that's something I'm really looking forward to. We'll call it Motivo's Law, just like Moore's Law for computers. <laughs> cool. What so, about you, Kevin? Uh, I mean, I think, you know, obviously being being a little bit younger, I think obviously the AI stuff, I think, you know, I, I, I could see a place for it. I think um, at the end of the day, 
a little bit back to Julius's point, though, I think it's ultimately going to be how you use it, and, and the person that's that's you know giving these inputs is still going to be incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, you know, I've seen I've seen some of these um, these um, ways of integrating AI into like like say SolidWorks, where you say, okay, well, I want to connect this plane to this plane, but I, I want it to you know figure out where the load path is going and I want it to minimize material usage and, you know, generate a complex geometry. Um, you know, those kind of things are really cool um, and and can be useful, but, you know, at the end of the day, is it going to be something that can actually be manufactured or is it going to be something that has to be, you know, complex 3D printed um, and, and, you know, how the engineer then works with that, uh, you know, that tool or that part, I think that's going to be kind of critical. Um, so yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think uh, some, some integration could be, could be very cool, uh, but it's going to come down to how it's used and how it's controlled, I think. Definitely. And so a lot of the conversation about AI, I mean, it is in the present, but a lot of it is also down to the future, but zooming back into like right now, what would you say is top of mind for 2024 for Motivo? What do you, what are you looking forward to this year? Uh, what are your priorities? Um, and how are you going to approach them? I'm looking for all the improvements that Build is announcing. <laughs> I mean, we we've been using Build for for almost a year now, and your guys' evolution has been mind blowing. So I'm honestly looking forward to you know all the things that that you're actually working on that are not yet. Um, public knowledge, but we had a sneak peek. Uh, others, I think, have already been announced, like the bill materials capabilities. I'm I'm a nerd for bill of materials, so I'm really <laughs> looking forward to that. Uh, aside from that, I'm looking forward to more projects and I I always wish for the projects that we've never even heard of or something that is completely novel. Uh, we're seeing a lot of very innovative creators that come to us with environmental related challenges how to tackle global warming, how to tackle sustainable uh, food. So those projects are super complex, but very impactful and, and very meaningful. So I'm looking forward to, to what surprising projects will be coming, will be, uh, yeah, will be knocking at our, at our door. I think for me, uh, you know, I'm Julius as a as a bomb nerd, but I think I would be a uh, like... bomb without a B at the end. <laughs> Sorry, <Yeah>. yes. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm I'm really looking forward to the kind of manufacturing space and and what we can do here. And and you know, we we invested in all this technology a few years ago with our our, our um, sheet metal laser with our press brake. And that opened a lot of doors for us to be able to produce different different types of projects, different you know prototyping. Um, but that's just the beginning, and I think there's going to be some really cool new tools and technology that we're going to be able to start using soon. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to kind of seeing what those look like and how we can use them to help expedite our projects to to prototype. Um, and, and, you know, figure out what kind of new types of projects we can take on because, you know, maybe we can take on more, more just straight up manufacturing projects uh, as well as, you know, these kind of new novel concepts um, that require a lot more of that kind of startup mentality. And if you were to ask uh, some of my direct reports that are not in this room, they would all say, Oh, we want, we just want more car projects. <laughs> we have a lot of car enthusiasts here and we've done a lot of project cars. Uh, like we helped uh, build the first 3D printed supercar. We have, we are co-authors in a patent for how to 
have 3D metal 3D printed links with carbon fiber tubes to build uh, configurable chassis. Uh, we've done autonomous retrofit of um, standard vehicles from from single wheels to 18 wheelers. Uh, so yeah, a lot of people here are looking forward to seeing way more car projects. <laughs> Cool. Well, any viewers out there who are working on car projects or at a company that's involved with autonomous vehicles or cars, you heard it from them yourselves, uh, go reach out to Motivo after this. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> Julius, Kevin, um, it was really great having you guys uh, be able to chat with us today. Um, it was a pleasure learning more about Motivo, your design processes, and really everything that goes into building up this amazing company that you guys work for. Um, Isha and I, uh, very happy to have had the chance to talk with you guys today. And we definitely work, uh, look forward to collaborating more in the future. Likewise, it's been a pleasure uh, having Bill help us with our cat managing needs and keep up the good work. At this rate, who knows where you will be a year from now. Wow, what an amazing session. Thanks for taking a look at the webinar we put together with the team over at Motivo. We'll be rolling out more of these conversations soon, so make sure to stay tuned to our social channels to see who's up next. If you're interested in learning more about Build, you can visit us on LinkedIn or check out getbuild.com. And if you'd like to take a closer look at the work that Motivo is doing, check out their website, motivo.com. See you all next time.